Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, again, I'd say I'd like to talk a little bit about in situ electron microscopy. And first, I would like to thank my collaborators and the funding sources. The, this work is funded by the National Science Foundation. All right, so if you were to take liquid water and say it has a colloidal solution in it, and you were to put it in the high vacuum of an electron microscope, what do you think would happen? Would the water stay there? No, it would quickly evaporate away. And so what this means is if you want to image the dynamics of colloidal crystals in solution, you need to find a way to keep them in their liquid. And so what people have done previously is they've taken these systems, you can dry out a system, you can take a picture of it, or you can freeze it very quickly and take a picture. And then you can do this over and over and over at different time steps in order to come up with a little flip book in order to try and understand the dynamics of what's going on in your system. Now this is something that is very tedious, and so it would be nice if we could overcome this limitation of the electron microscope so that we can image aqueous solutions directly with the electron beam in order to get the high resolution that the electron microscope provides. So for example, uh, if you were to look at a biological process, in the bottom right here you can see one of those flip books that was made by doing cryo-imaging of a molecular motor, in this case it's myosin walking on actin filament, and what they did is they took all those pictures, which would be akin to going to a horse race with a regular camera, taking pictures of many horses as they run by, in order to try and understand their gallop. You can do pretty well by doing this, and you can see here the motion is pretty well understood from this process, but some of the subtle nuances in these processes might be missing if you can't image directly the dynamics. And so Institute Electron Microscopy of Liquid Systems are, is a platform where we can start to be, we can begin to look into these different uh, areas of interest. And today, I would like to talk a little bit about the colloidal crystals that we've been looking at, or the colloidal aggregation. Another reason that this science is interesting is because just a few years ago, a Nobel Prize winner said that it was basically impossible to happen. And I'll just read this to you. In spite of their importance, these processes are still poorly understood. The solid liquid interfaces are much harder to probe than their solid vacuum counterparts. Essentially, and this is the important part, essentially all experiments making use of, the, of electron beams become inapplicable when a fluid is present. Well, today, I'd like to show you how we overcome this limitation. So how do we do it? We use the nanoquarium, which is a home-built cell invented by Grogan and Bao here at Penn. And what this is, is it's a hermetically sealed device made with standard silicon technologies that isolates a thin liquid layer that is in a hermetically sealed environment so that we can maintain near atmospheric pressures within this device while still maintaining the high vacuum required for the electron microscope to work. Since we use standard batch processes, we can deposit electrodes in whatever configurations we want in order to have actuation and sensing. And we'll use those a little bit later. So how does this work? To give you just an illustration of how one of these cells would work is you can take a silicon wafer that has an electron transparent window in the center, and then you can take another one, basically two standard TEM grids, put a spacer in between them, seal them. In this case, we do direct wafer bonding. So our two silicon wafers are mated in a way that it makes a chemical seal, and this is what makes the device hermetic. You fill it with your solution, and then you can image directly your process with the electron beam in order to get that nanometer resolution that the electron microscope offers. So one of the first things we did is we looked at gold spheres. In this case, we have 50 nanometer gold spheres in water. And we image them. And we can look at the very early process dynamics of looking at single colloids aggregating with another one to make dimers and trimers. And we can do this on a longer scale where this video here is we're looking at five nanometer gold colloids. Uh, they are charge stabilized in water, and we can look at them over time so that we can go from those individual particles aggregating to the large scale particles. Now the nice thing about this process for diffusion limited aggregation is it's something that has been well studied, and you can look at the results using light scattering techniques in order to get ensemble averages. So what we can do now is we can take these dynamical videos and analyze them from our device and then compare it to the well-known literature in order to make sure that what we're imaging, is, the way that we're imaging is not changing the physics dramatically. So when we do that, we can look at the fractal dimension, the mean size of clusters as a function of time, and other parameters, and we see that we match up pretty uh, well with what's available in the literature, showing that this institute platform is going to be a powerful platform for looking at different colloidal systems. 
Now you might wonder, why do you have these charge stabilized particles that are normally stable? Why are they aggregating in this device? So one of the things that's important to understand is that in these devices, we are exposing our sample to a large amount of radiation. The electron beam is irradiating the medium at a very, very high rate. We're shooting many electrons in a very small area. And so what this means is that there are going to be chemical reactions that occur. And you need dozens of reactions in order to count just for neat water radiolysis, is what it's called, alone. And we've actually done this model, and we've run simulations in order to see what's going on. I'll talk just about what's relevant for this aggregation here. And what we found is that even for neat water, with the high radiation dosages, which you can start at, say, 10 to the 5th grays per second, and can, in electron microscopy can go up to 10 to the 10th and even a little bit higher depending on your system uh, parameters. And these experiments were on the order of 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th grays per second. And what you can see is for very low dose rates, you don't change your solution pH. But in this case, we're changing the solution pH dramatically. And we can drop the solution from a neutral uh, solution of pH 7 down to about 3.5. And, and so what this means for our colloidal system that we're looking at here is that we can change the zeta potential and basically destabilize the particles that were originally charge stabilized because we're going closer to the isoelectric point. So now we know that we have a device that will allow us to look at liquid systems and look at different colloidal systems, but we do have the caveat that the beam is interacting with the sample, and that's something we need to remember as we go forward with all of these solutions that we look at. So one system I want to talk about is gold nanorods. They're 20 nanometers by 40 nanometers, and they're provided by the Murray Group here at Penn. And so what we did is those integrated electrodes, we applied a bias to them in order to generate a large bubble. So this bubble has been created by electrolysis, and this gives us a nice platform where we have the opportunity to probe the interface by looking at the edge of this bubble. So this bubble is going to be very large. Uh, you can see that it, the size of this window is 100 microns. So this is, the radius of this bubble is tens of microns. But we still have a liquid layer around the edge of the window. And the window, at the very edges, you can see there's an intensity gradient as you go off the edge. At the very edge, the height of the liquid layer is going to be the height of the device, which in this case is about 200 nanometers. And then we'll have a varying thickness as we approach the interface. And then finally, in the center, we have a large bubble that will still be encapsulated by a thin film. And the thin film stays there because the windows are made out of silicon nitride. And it is fairly wetting. It's not perfectly wetting, but as a contact angle, normally around 40 degrees. So we can zoom in and image at the interface in this device in order to see what dynamics occur. So first. We, what we have here is we have gold, these same gold nanorods, and they're at a receding contact line. And as we image this region, the contact line recedes, and the particles are kicked out into that thin film. I'll let this run one more time. And something to note here is that as these particles are sitting in the film, they are aggregating together in a little clump but it's mainly due to the convective force on the particles. To show that a little better, here we'll look at an advancing contact line. And so now the electron beam, when we image this region, is causing particles to be pushed. And we can see that even in this thin film liquid, the particles aren't sticking together. So this isn't a diffusion-limited process. This is a process that's mediated by the interactions with the liquid interface. One thing I'd like to point out of interest is after it zooms in, when it zooms out, I'd like you to look at what the interface is doing as we change the zoom. Notice that it was, the interface was receding. Now, that dose rate that I talked about in terms of the electron microscopy, in this case for a stem, it's going to be a function of the irradiated area. So what happens in a scanning transmission electron microscope is you have a beam that's being rastered across your viewing area. And this beam has some current to it. So it's a very small spot size on the order of a nanometer that is rastered back and forth very quickly. And so the way that you estimate the dose rate in this case is by taking that current that you're passing through and averaging it over the area. So as you zoom in, the area that you're dispersing these electrons becomes smaller, and your dose rate increases. So now we'll image another region of the device. 
And here we have some very interesting behavior going on with the interface. These large clumps on the bottom, those are salt crystals on the outside of the device that are left over from the manufacturing process. So though they serve as a nice measure of distance, they do not affect uh, directly what's happening in solution. They will affect what happens to the electron beam. And so here we see, this, we see similar results as to what we saw in the previous two videos, where this interface is moving these particles around, and it's still going to be mainly due to the interface motion. At the beginning of this video, you may have seen many particles coming and sticking to the window. And so this is implying that there's some sort of charging effect that's going on in this system that we, that, that's causing both the interface to be unstable and to move and for the particles to come into the field of view. So we have an open question left in this. What is the driving force that actually causes the interface to move and also ultimately causes the convection? First, the first thing that we thought it was was, electro, uh, was evaporation. And we came up with a simple model that I'll go over next with that. But there are other possibilities, and we're not exactly sure as to what the driving force is. We know it's beam mediated, but we're not sure of exactly what's causing this system to move. Nonetheless, we can look at evaporation and use it as a model system. And what we do is we have this bubble that was created by the electrodes, by electrolysis, and we irradiate some region of the device with the electron beam. And then if you assume that there's some evaporation, this can allow for flow to occur. And there'll be a couple of different uh, processes going on here. So you, we're in a Stokes regime, so you can get the velocity as a function of the pressure drop. And then we can say that there, there's a pressure drop in this system that's gonna be due to two forces. One is gonna be due to the curvature of the interface, but then two, it's also going to be due to the disjoining pressure, which is a result of Van der Waals forces. Because our liquid layers here are so thin that Van der Waals forces are now again important. And this thin film is gonna be on the order of 10 nanometers in thickness. So you have to take this into account. So these two terms will contribute to the pressure drop. And we can use this in order to solve for the velocity caused by the interface. So again, we have evaporation or some beam-mediated process that's causing mass flow out of the irradiated region. And particles that are near the interface, they're gonna see some velocity profile that is a function of that pressure drop. And the very interesting thing that occurs is that there's actually a maximum in the velocity that is not exactly at the interface, it's at some distance away from it because of the balance of these two pressure forces. And so what that means is that you can imagine that if viscous drag is what's pushing these particles around, there's a minimum velocity needed to cause them to move. And so only particles at a certain distance can overcome the frictional force that's attaching them to the window in order to be pushed into solution. And so even as the interface moves, you can have particles that are kicked out of the bulk liquid and into the thin film, which is what we saw in those videos. So again, our first hypothesis was that this is due to, uh, this, uh, is due to evaporation. But then we noticed when we went through and did the calculations, when we started developing those radiolysis models, that the heating due to the electron beam is going to be very small. It's only going to be a couple degrees C. So evaporation is most likely not the dominant force. And now that we have a little bit better idea of what's happening in terms of the charging, especially in this video where the particles are being stuck to the window in a fashion that looks like it's due to charging, we really feel that electro-wetting is probably the, uh, the dominant process, but we're still unsure. So if anyone has ideas on that, we are definitely open to discussing. So today, I showed you a platform, in situ liquid cell electron microscopy. We have our own device here, the Nano Aquarium. These platforms are also commercially available. And I wanted to show you that it is a powerful tool for imaging these type of systems. We also showed that we can look at particles, nanoparticles at the interface and their dynamics and interacting with them. And this is gonna be some function of the beam mediated uh, damage that we're doing to the sample. But some hydrodynamic force is going to be pushing these particles around and we're still trying to close that question. So with that, I would be open to any questions.